Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap at the end of the week with my good friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts. Hey, Lance, how are you doing today, buddy? Well, it's Friday and glad it's over. Why is it lately like every Friday? I'm like, glad it's over. It's just been, it's been one of those periods in the market where it's like, I'm glad to get to Friday and the market's going to be shut down for two days. Yeah, I, I think that's just kind of an indicator of the type of market we're in right now. And you were actually supposed to be off this week, but it doesn't yep. sound like you got much of a break. No, yeah, I was supposed to be on vacation this week. And unfortunately, with the Fed and, and banking crises, yeah, I, I didn't get this week did not go well. So. All right. Well, let's 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 dive into it for folks because there's a lot to talk about. We had a, a lot of news this week. You know, the, the <coughs> Fed conference, uh, Treasury Secretary Jen Yellen, Yellen has been doing a lot of speaking, a lot of confusing people. Um, but this week is a lot like last week, where we're kind of ending the week pretty close to where we started. Yeah. Um, so the markets haven't really gone anywhere on a net basis for the past couple of weeks here. But we've sort of been whipsawed around by all sorts of news and fears and, you know, everyone's glued to their monitors for the latest bit of news coming out about whether it's the banking crisis or the authorities response to that or whatnot. So um, why don't we just sort of dive in here? I guess, I guess the big news this week was uh, the federal open, the Fed's uh, open market committee met. Uh, Jerome Powell gave a press conference off of that. I've kind of on this channel, given a lot of my thoughts on, on what he said, so I, I won't over repeat myself here. But but what did you take away from what Powell had to say? Well, I, and know, sorry, I should also say the Fed, the Fed as expected, did hike by twenty five basis points. So so let's back up to to last week because we talked about this, and I said then I said I expect the Fed to hike by twenty five basis points and then give a nod to the banking issue, which is exactly what they did. They hiked twenty five basis points and gave a nod towards the banking situation saying, you know, hey, we're gonna make sure, do whatever we need to do to ensure that the banking, you know, it remains sound and stable. One of the most interesting comments that he made, which didn't get a lot of press time, but he said that, you know, they are gonna, they're gonna take some time here and review what happened with the banks. And, you know, and, and, you know, try to figure out what happened because they, they, he specifically says that this just cropped up over the weekend and we weren't really aware, which kind of scares the crap out of me a little bit because, you know, it's twofold, two things. One, you caused the problem by hiking interest rates and sucking reserves out of the bank. Two is that you are the ones that are always stress testing these banks and saying, oh, everything's fine. Everything's dandy. These banks can withstand a surge in unemployment and, a, and, a, and higher interest rates, and they'll be just fine. And yet every time something happens, we got to bail them all out again. So, you know, it kind of scares me a bit that Jerome Powell actually said, well, yeah, we're going to study this event and, and, and see what happens. Like he doesn't know. So, you know, that kind of bothered me a bit. Um, but the other side of this was, and, and if you notice during his press conference, he made a, a, a very asserted effort to repeat multiple times that they're going to keep hiking interest rates to combat inflation. You know, he repeatedly said inflation is too high. We want to get it down to 2%. We're not even we're close to that. We're going to have to maintain our, our inflation stance for right now. Markets really kind of shrugged all that off. Yeah. Can I just push back on that for one second? Sure. Um, so I, I did hear him say, look, inflation, getting inflation to 2% is still priority one, two, and three. Totally agree with you on that. Okay. What I heard him say was, um, we hiked this time. Um, I'm not committing to another rate hike yet, that we're going to wait and see you know, at, at the next meeting what everything looks like on the ground. But he, he raised this issue of, because of the concerns around the banking system, that banks are now going to be tightening lending standards from here. And he says that actually substitutes for additional rate hikes. I can't entirely quantify it, but it's additional tightening on top of the 25 basis points that we're doing today. So we're gonna kind of wait and monitor and then we'll decide then. So that's what I heard. Did you hear the same? Yeah, no, absolutely. And in fact, um, I'm actually writing about that in this weekend's newsletter because you know, the, the, whenever we've had Fed, you know, uh, sorry, whenever we've had bank lending standards tighten as rapidly as they have as of late, you have always had a recession and they are in, in a 
a very kind of interesting manner, a de facto rate hike on the economy because you're extracting capital from the economy by making lending standards a lot tighter. So yeah, absolutely. You know, he, but you know, my point was though, is that, you know, he didn't let up on that inflation fight. He said, yes, we're going to, you know, we're watching bank lending standards, which are going to act as rate hikes, which is going to slow economic growth, which is going to lower the rate of inflation. So they hike and the interesting thing is, is that what's happening with bank lending standards is going to act as additional rate hikes. And again, I, I've got a chart in this weekend's newsletter in particular showing that. And we've had a very dramatic spike. Those lending standards are nearly as tight as they were going into 2008. Yeah. And the reason why I just want to underscore this is it's twofold. Um, one is, is that we may be closer to the pause than Powell had been thinking up till now because he now realizes, oh, I've got the banking industry tightening now to help me here, right? We don't know if that's the case or not yet. Um, we still may get a rate hike you know, at the next meeting from here. We don't know. But Powell has basically kind of stopped the forward guidance of, yes, I'm doing X rate hikes from here, and now saying, I'm going to monitor because of all this stuff. Um, and real quick, the, yeah. you know, the market is now pricing in almost 150 basis points of rate cuts <laughs> by the end of the year. So- you know, I have a, that here in my notes to talk about with you. Yeah, yeah, there's a huge detachment between what the market thinks and what the Fed says. So we'll see. Well, and on, on that, though, so um, so Powell was was directly asked about that. Um, they said, hey, look, the market is pricing a bunch of rate cuts, you know, starting pretty soon, like summer. And Powell just said, hey, it's not my plan. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, I think his words were, that's not my default. You know, he's always, always going to leave the door open for something to happen. Sure. But he basically just said, yeah, it may be what the market thinks, but that's not what I'm planning to do here. Absolutely. Um, now, uh, that gap is really big. And and what's interesting about it is it's not that far away from when the, the two start really diverging. So um, we don't have all that long to wait, but it's going to be interesting to see. You know, does, does the market's expectations slam into the disappointment of higher for longer? Or does something happen, banking system-wise or other, that forces Powell to start cutting? And again, as you and I have talked about, if that's indeed the case, probably not going to be for bullish reasons. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's a very interesting case about that, because this weekend's newsletter is specifically talking about the fact that we now have buy signals across the board for the market, which, you know, you're going, wait a second, we're, we're having bank crises and, and markets are triggering buy signals? And yeah, that's the case. You know, on I think the first week of February, we wrote an article talking about the correction had begun for the markets. We said, hey, we just registered sell signals across the market. We need to raise cash levels. You need to reduce equity risk. We've likely started a correction. Well, that turned out to be exactly the case. And the market, you know, corrected down to the, below the 200 day moving average. We tested December lows. And interestingly enough, right in the midst of, of all this, you know, banking problem, um, you know, the markets had the first two days of, the, of this past week, the markets rallied fairly strongly going into the, the FOMC meeting. And that triggered those buy signals that, you know, normally suggest that we're going to have higher stock prices over the course of the next few weeks or next couple of months. And, you know, I, I find that a very interesting dichotomy to all the headline risk we have in the markets right now, particularly, you know, just from the media side of it and, and commentators, et cetera. Um, and, and it's interesting, the, the action of the market this week has actually been fairly bullish. We, we've continued to retest support levels. Um, even on Friday, we woke up to Deutsche Bank may be the next bank to fail. Markets opened almost a percent lower and then rallied back into positive territory by late afternoon. So, you know, that's very you know, kind of bullish action in terms of buyers stepping into the market to buy weakness. It's just been a very interesting dichotomy over the last week, you know, based between what headlines are saying and what the market's actually doing. I'm, and I'm curious, is there is there any clear reason why that's going on here? You know, like what is what is driving the market to to want to grind higher in the midst of all the uncertainty going on right now? Well, I think I think it all goes back to what we just said: is that what the markets are betting on is they're betting on bet, betting on the Fed to cut rates. They're betting on a return to accommodative policy, and that you know that this is all going to lead to you know lower levels of inflation. And and, I, and ironically, um, S and P, you know, I track earnings fairly closely because if you want to know what the markets are going to do, 
we said this, I think I said this uh, on our uh, on our conference with New Harbor. Um, I said there's, you know, if you're if you're buying gold, the only thing you pay, pay, pay attention to is real rates. Real rates tell you where gold's headed. Stock market is earnings estimates. So if you want to know where earning uh, where the stock market's going to go, look at earnings estimates. Earning so S and P just released their 2024 estimates. They are currently estimating that earnings for the S and P 500 will be back to their peak levels of January 2020. Now. That is totally flies in the face of any type of, you know, oh, no, no, by, by the way, they're also saying that quarter one was the trough in earnings. So they are predicting no recession, no, in fact, they're predicting fairly strong economic growth at a time when inflation is dropping. So, you know, this really doesn't line up with what you would expect economically going forward, but that's what the, that's what the analysts are predicting right now. And that's why I think one of the reasons the markets are, are grinding, trying to grind higher is to accommodate this view of this no recession, soft landing type scenario. Okay. Um, not, I'm not saying that's right, by the way. I'm just telling you what it is. Well, I, I know. And what I'm trying to figure out is how to diplomatically ask you, um, you know, where you fall <laughs> on yeah. this. Well, no, I, I, look, where I fall is, is that we've got buy signals. And so we added some exposure this week, period. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll continue to hold that exposure as long as we have buy signals. When we get sell signals, we'll take that exposure back off again. Um, but look, earnings cannot grow to $224 a share in earnings, which puts you above the long-term growth trend of the, of the markets and the economy. So, uh, th so these earnings estimates are going to come down. You know, they always come in high. We always ratchet them down by 30%. And that's why we call it millennial earnings season, because everybody gets a trophy for beating lowered estimates, right? So, you know, that's the way this is going to work out. The question is, or is going to be, is whether or not the analysts are entirely wrong and you have a recession and you're going to get a drop to about $157 in earnings, which is a very different out outlook for the market at that point. Okay. Well, you have a, a, a recent report that you just issued on sort of the recessionary likelihood uh, or the likelihood of recession. Let's see your mark that. We'll get to that in a little bit in this conversation here. I, I want to stick still on the, the Fed for a moment, um, because one of the other things that Powell did, and I, th I think he did what he had to do um, in this case, was was project, you know, his confidence in the banking system, right? He was asked, you know, multiple times, you know, how safe is the system, all that stuff. And he basically just said, hey, you know, read my lips, American banking system safe, depositors should not worry. Um we think we've got what happened there under control. It was a you know, relatively small number of, of banks that aren't systemically important. And you saw that we stepped in to do what needed to be done. Something else breaks. If we need to come in, we'll come in early. We'll come in hard. Like we're going to protect depositors. So you know, I think he had to do that. Um, that then, of course, raised the question of like, well, are you backing all depositors now, even the uninsured? And he was kind of coy about that, which I think was probably the right thing for him to do. Um, trying to be in his shoes, right? Project confidence, but not over promise. Um, but he basically still underlined, he just said, look, we will do whatever it takes, right? So he kind of, you know, I think quelled the waters. What he said quelled the waters more. Meanwhile, <laughs> you had Janet Yellen out there just making everybody confused. So while Powell was talking, she was basically getting the markets all riled up. And that's why the market sort of started uh, rallying after the the Fed minutes were released um, or the Fed announcement was released, but then later on in the day started falling off. And my Thursday, yeah. you know, was, was such a, a low open. Um, then she came out on Thursday and sort of tried to walk back her comments, and then she came out again today and we're walking back her comments from Thursday. Yeah. And, and, now, and there's and now, this like now, now they're calling an emergency meeting of the financial stability group or whatever so exactly which includes if you read who's on that it's like everybody you know it's yeah. the head of the sec the head of the irs it's it, jerome powell it's her i mean so of course it makes you wonder like what the hell are all these guys meeting for going into well, a weekend there must be something big going on right who yeah, knows well, but that's yeah. what it makes you think but you know, the thing is is that bothers me about janet yellen is 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 and, and look more than a few people have raised this is that you know she may be kind of moving into that biden camp where she's not quite running at 100% capacity mentally because she's just been saying, she's been saying stuff now for a while. It's just kind of off the wall. And 
you know, and it was interesting. She made this comment of, oh, we're not going to back the banks and, and, and we're not going to make all depositors whole. And then she gets the phone call from the White House that says, uh, you serve at the pleasure of the president. Right. You will be <laughs> issuing a statement. And then it's just it's just been weird for her, you know, because it, it seems like she's just saying stuff without asking anybody about what she's going to say. And she's not and it's like she's not on the same page as everybody else right now. Well, it, it, what's interesting about that is, and I'm just speculating here, but, you know, she had Powell's role before Powell did, right? So yeah, technically the Fed is independent, right? It's able to make its own statements without having to run everything by the administration. Now, they're probably a lot more politically connected than admitted, but still they have that veneer of independence. So she's probably maybe used to that, but she doesn't have that independence right. being in Treasury, right? Like she is basically an arm of the executive branch and she's got to do whatever the chief tells her to do, right? But she serves at the pleasure of the president. That's it. And he can fire her tomorrow. So. Yeah, interesting. OK, so anyway, so but but th this is not helping. Right. In other words, like I, no. like I said, I think Powell said what he needed to say to kind of quell the waters a bit. But then she stirred him back up again. And then there's been the back and forth, which, of course, makes people realize, like, OK, it doesn't seem like the two people who are supposed to be running the system together are in lockstep here. And then there's this meeting called and we don't know why. And again. It, yeah. Sometimes these emergency meetings are, you know, nothing. They're called emergencies, but they actually are scheduled in advance. Sometimes they're just for administrative stuff. So I don't want to read too much into it, but I'm just saying it's not helping, you know, smooth the waters the way that that Powell had started look, to do. Look, look, I, I, you know, two things. I'm not surprised that they're calling this meeting. Whether it's an actual emergency or not is is irrelevant. You know, look, you just had Credit Suisse basically pull a bear Stearns and get bought out by. Uh, UBS. UBS. Um, you basically got Deutsche Bank potentially having issues. Now they came out and said today, no, Deutsche Bank's fine. It's 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 all dandy. The market rallied back on that. But you know, there is certainly financial stress throughout the banking system. And 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 we are not done with the banking system in the US. There is a tremendous amount of deposits being drawn out of small banks, putting into large banks, or buying treasuries with the money which is draining reserves of these banks. You just had $258 billion worth of, of discount window taps uh, through Wednesday. And I'm sure it's probably higher on Thursday and Friday. So, you know, there's definitely stress in the financial system. So yeah, they should be kind of getting together and saying, hey, look, we've got some banking issues going on. We need to make sure we're all on the same page uh, for Janet's sake. Um, so, you know, so we, we're all kind of giving the same message out about the stability and soundness of the banking system, because if they if they make it, you know, this is the risk that Janet runs, and and you know, and and, and I'm not surprised she got a phone call very quickly from somebody saying walk back that statement because she runs the risk as the head of the Treasury of causing a bank run. You know, this is the one thing we've always said about the Fed: the Federal Reserve can never come out and say, you know, guys, we did everything we could, um, but there's a recession coming. You know, sorry, because immediately the market would be down a thousand points. You'd be in a recession tomorrow. And, and so, you know, the Fed would cause that by making a specific statement. This is why, you know, Alan, Grandspan, uh, Alan Greenspan was the master of, of dichotomy when he, whenever he spoke, because he would say a whole bunch of stuff without saying anything, because that's how much power they wield over the psychology of the markets. And so you say the wrong thing. You create the actual event that you're trying to, right. you know, avoid. And this is Janet Yellen. If she comes out and makes the wrong statement, she causes a run on the banks. People go, oh, my gosh, I'm getting my money out of the bank. Boom. Now you've got a problem. So, you know, this is something that is, is very serious. And you can't just have people kind of running off willy nilly saying stuff without having a plan in place to back it up. Yeah, and, and that's it's interesting. So, you know, I had um, a banking specialist on the program yesterday, and um, he's, you know, he, he's not that worried right now, given the way that the banking system structured and, and, you know, the fact that the banks that have gone under so far, at least in the US, well, really all the ones, including uh, Credit Suisse, they were the weak players, right? And he said, "Look, you know, banks fail, and it's, it's not an uncommon thing. And they they you, you lose a lot of them during a recession, and that's sort of the natural cycle. And we're just seeing the weak players this time, you know, start to go. And there doesn't seem to be massive systemic risk here the way that we had going into two thousand eight. 
I, I think we are all shocked, and including the folks running the system, that it's not more resilient than it is, right? Especially after we've been sold that that it's oh everything's great, you know, banking system's bulletproof now. Um, but that being said, as you and I have said, you know, even even a great run bank can fall victim to a bank run if the panic is big enough and the bank run is big enough, right? So when we're at this point where just worries are so heightened, you do have to be really careful on the communications side of things. And and well, yeah, and look, I, you know, I used to manage money. You know, I used to manage CD books. For you bank. still manage money. <laughs> well, I know, but I used to do it for bank. And, and look, and at some point, you know, the Federal Reserve, as I said, they're going to have this meeting where they're going to review what happened and try to make sure. There's one simple solution to all of this because you would have known what was going to happen before it happened if we were marking assets to market. Yeah. And, and this is the whole thing. We've got to get back to marking assets, all assets to market because- if you'd done that, then as the Fed was hiking interest rates, we would have seen collateral falling and we would have been able to identify that Silicon Valley Bank had stress on their books. And then when that deposit run started at the bank and they started to have to sell collateral, you would have already had fair warning that was coming. But because they were marking everything at market, when they had to go to market and sell the stuff, it got sold at a deep loss. And that was just what started the whole spread. So we've got to get back. We need to, all we got to, it's very simple. We repealed rule 157 in 2009, put it back on the books, just reenact it and say, you've got to mark to market, follow gap principles, and you get a more sound you know, financial system. You can't do all the funny stuff that we're doing and banks would not pass their stress tests by doing this, but you'd be able to identify the weak banks and solve some of this problem before it became a real issue. Right. And you know, DC, for some reason, doesn't listen to you and me, Lance, and you're not president yet. Um, yep. But I do think that that we would benefit from, you know, some sort of provision in, in the legislative process that says if you're enacting an emergency temporary measure, it must expire as of certain date and, and it, it must be actively renewed after that if everybody agrees, right? Because you and I have gone through the whole litany of temporary government actions that have just become permanent thereon. And another important one in the bank system is is the removal of all reserve requirements yep. uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, I literally just informed somebody of that last night who, who had no clue. He literally asked me, how much do banks have to keep on reserve? And I basically gave him the update. And it just, I saw his brain explode in real time. <laughs> no, and it, it's it's quite amazing. And, you know, but, you know, it's, it's the old Reaganism, which says that, you know, once a law becomes, you know, once you put a law in the books, it's permanent. You can't repeal it because once it's in there, it's done and everybody gets used to it. Everybody adopts exactly. to it. You yeah. can't repeal it. But again, there's some things that we need to do. And, and this, again, this is what bothers me about Jerome Powell saying that, oh, we're going to review what happened because it caught us by surprise. That That's terribly scary that you got caught by surprise by this, that you didn't know that hiking interest rates was going to you know, lower reserve requirements and uh, lower collateral values and, and cause these reserve problems. With banks, the fact you didn't realize you were doing that to banks and causing a transfer of assets out of the bank, that that's super scary. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I've read some stuff from Powell from back in 2012 or whatever. I, I I'm not certain that that caught him by surprise that he's putting increased pressure on banks by doing this accelerated rate hike cycle. Um, I sort of interpret his comments more of just like, yeah, we didn't know that Silicon Valley Bank was going to blow up like this, um, which still is a failure of oversight, oversight. and his, that he that's what he's responsible for. So it, it's not confidence inspiring. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, there, I'm there with you. Um, and, and you know, he was getting pressed a little bit and he basically just said at the end, hey, we're going to look into it. And it was kind of interesting because I was sort of wondering for the reporters that were pressing, like, what were you expecting? Like Jerome Powell's not going to say, yeah, we screwed up here, right? He's just not gonna, <laughs> like he's not gonna say I'm causing a recession. He's not gonna admit to to screwing up. So that's probably the best we're gonna get out of him, which is just like, yeah, I, I didn't see it coming. I'm gonna look into it. Um, but, but back to the importance of communication. So one thing that Powell did not talk about this time, which he has been pretty vocal about in the past, and, and its omission kind of worried me, is he didn't, I don't know if he mentioned the lag effect once, um, he may have, and I may have missed it, but he just he he did not harp on it the way that he has in the past. And I think it's becoming even more important now, one, because, as you said, Lance, you can explain Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, you know, as victims of the first lag shockwave, 
right? We're, we're about a year from when the first rate hike hit, right? And this is about when we would expect that to fully be enforced. And it's already taking down, you know, components of the banking system. Um, but also, you know, like, and maybe I'm hoping too much from him, but like, I think he, I think he really understands the lag effect because he's talked about it a lot. I, I think the lag effect is now getting ramped up from this increased bank lending tightening that's going on right now. So, you know, we're creating even more of it going forward. And, um, you know, it's, I would much rather have him tell people, hey, remember that pain I told you about? It's going to start getting worse from here, folks, right? And I'm going to be holding steady. I'm, I'm going to be paused. I'm not going to be bringing, you know, the rates down the way that you want me to as we go through this, because I got to get inflation down. And, and I think he, I think he should be doing that because, you know, in his role of public servant, to a certain extent, he's going to be getting people ready to take precautions today. So they're just not sleepwalking into this. And getting, you know, basically becoming collateral damage without any awareness. So, you know, I maybe I'm reading too much into his not mentioning it this time around, but but that really struck me. And I, I really felt that that was, I don't know, maybe something he may be a little culpable for going forward in terms of like, hey, well, you, you really should have been given the warning and you weren't. Right. Well, you know, but this is the but this is the whole, you know, paradox of thrift, right? And, and and so this is the, the the balancing act that the Fed runs. As I said before, you know, they can't come out and say, hey, we're going to hike rates and cause a recession, right? They can't say that because you'd have a recession immediately. Right. And, but it's the same thing, right? If I warn investors and I warn individuals, hey, you know what? You might want to go stick some more money into savings. That slows the economy. It's the paradox of thrift, right? Less spending in the economy, you get slower economic growth, brings down inflation. Uh, and that's the reason he hikes interest rates, right? Is to, to make the cost of borrowing too high so that you won't borrow money. That's the whole point. So it, it is interesting, you know, he walks this, this, you know, this fine line between, you know, I can't warn you, you've got to read between the lines. I can't warn you that we're about to have a recession because if, if I warn you, then you're going to take the action that causes the recession. Right. So that, that's what's so inane about this, though, which is, okay, so the world now, waits with bated breath for the next Fed announcement, right? Because what right. the Fed does pretty much drives everything, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody is waiting to hear what the Fed has to say, but we can't rely on what the Fed has to say because it's not going to tell us necessarily the full truth because if it did, then we would act in a certain way, right? So then we need to have shows like this where people are kind of, you know, throwing the chicken bones and trying to discern what Powell actually meant by what he said. Well, like, it's ridiculous. And of course, the average person is just like, the Fed said X, so I guess I should, I, that's the authority I'm listening to, right? But they're clearly, as you said, not getting the true story. Well, this is, again, going back to Alan Greenspan, you know, he was this master, he was called the maestro because he was this master of what they call Greenspeak. And, and literally, he would come out for an hour and say a bunch of stuff that nobody really understood. And then we would spend the next month trying to parse through right. what he had said, trying to figure out what he meant. Um, but that was because of that same reason. Powell's not nearly as adept at it as Alan Greenspan was, but it's the same kind of premise. Yeah, which funny, is funny, I've, I've heard that. Not, how to say a lot without saying anything. Yeah, I've heard that in private. Greenspan is a fine communicator and kind of prided himself on his ability yeah. to kind of smokescreen everybody. Yeah. Um, but, but anyways, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just such a weird system. It, it almost begs, you know, why even have these conferences if we, if we really can't, you know, hang our hats on what we're being told, right? It's, it's almost just like, just go off and do your own thing, Fed, and we'll, well, we'll look, just watch your actions and, and base our, our decisions on that. But anyways. Well, I, I, but, but wait, before Alan Greenspan, that's the way it was. I mean, literally you, you know, most people listening to your channel right now weren't around back in the 90s but you know well, actually back the, most people listen to my channel or your age or older but go ahead well, maybe, okay maybe but most people back in the 80s and 90s you know if i went and asked people on the streets like who's the head of the federal reserve what's the federal reserve right they had no idea and and, and you know they knew the president was they knew the vice president was but who's the secretary of the treasury no idea right and it's just now these people and, and really since the it really it was really kind of the the very late 90s and that kind of that turn into the first, you know, of the century where Alan Greenspan was coming a lot more vocal at that time. But that was where all of a sudden, you know, these central bankers became media figures. And and now we've and, and but still, even then, it wasn't primary to the to the whole you know functioning of the markets. 
But now to your point, we no longer look, and I've complained about this before, you know, we no longer look at fundamentals or, you know, earnings and those type of things really. I mean, we talk about this stuff, but the average investor isn't looking at those things. They're buying ETFs and then clinging on every word that the Fed says, right? Are we going to get QE or not QE? Are we going to pivot or not pivot? Who cares, right? Who cares about all that? What do the fundamentals tell you? Fundamentals tell you that stocks are way too expensive. You shouldn't own stocks, but you know we don't care about that. We just care about what the Fed does. Which is so criminal as we've talked about a lot, right? Which is because that's not investing. That's like oh, that's like off track betting, right? You know, it you're is. just trying to figure out, hey, what's what's this small group of people around this table going to decide next time? Exactly, and that that is the purest form of speculation. So when people, I, I always love it. People email is like, I'm a long term investor, really, because I'll bet your average whole time is probably six months or less. <laughs> so you know, if you're truly a long term investor, that's great. Buy fundamentals. Don't worry about the rest of the stuff. You know, because ultimately, at the end of the day, you buy cheap stocks, and in 20 years, you'll make a lot of money. That's just all there is to it. All right. Well, look, we're we're pre ranting here, and I have another yeah. rant that I want us to get to. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, there was a, a, an article that I read this week that caught my attention um, by uh, apparently a pretty smart guy named Lance Roberts. Um, <laughs> the article is called Recession Indicators Say the Fed Broke Something. Yeah. Um, all right. So on this channel, you are usually trying to hold me back and saying, hey, Adam, you're, you're getting too deep into the, the bearish data here. Let me let me give you the bull case here. Yeah. Um Obviously, Mr. Hyde took over in your brain when you wrote this thing. Um, but no, I'm, I'm joking. But but you yeah. you you went through a, you know back to fundamentals and whatnot. I mean, you just sort of went through a lot of data that said, hey, you know, looking at the data dashboard, there's a lot here to be concerned about. Um, so maybe let let's start where you talk about because um, this bank this this is uh, what we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, we've got uh, the can, banks. Yeah, can we back up? Can we back up real quick? Sure. So the, 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 the reason for the article is because for the last eight months, we've been writing article after article after article saying, hey, the Fed's hiking rates. They're going to hike it until they break something. Right. And so we now have broken something. And now that, you're and, ringing the bell saying oh, the yeah, this, this, this is the moment we have now broken something. And the Fed has now accomplished their task because every time in history that they hike rates, even not even as aggressively as this, but just hike rates previously, you've either caused a financial event of some sort, you know, a credit issue or a recession or an, and a bear market or some combination of all four. So here we are. And that's the whole reason. So that's the whole purpose of this article is just saying, hey, we've been saying this is going to happen. Here you are. It's now, it's now happening. Got it. Yeah. Great, great context. Um, and I want to go through some of your charts here, but um, real quick. Uh so, you know, I, I've been saying for a while that that I think the Fed is in danger of over tightening. Right. And we don't know. Um, so I've been advocating uh, if I were in Powell's shoes that I would have I'd, be, I'd pause and I probably would have paused a while ago and then waited for the lag effects to see if more tightening was needed. Um, obviously, with the banks now tightening more, that that makes me feel even more that 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 way. How about you? Do you do you look at it similarly or? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 well, I, I think I told you before is that if I was the Fed, okay, so if I was the Fed, king for a day, right? Yep. So when, you know, so March, let's go back to March 2020 real quick. March 2020 happens. I do exactly everything the Fed did, right? I buy junk bonds. I throw money at the markets. I do all that. Lower interest rates to zero. That was the proper response to the shutdown of the economy at that point to try to stave off a worse financial crisis situation. Appropriate response. The moment that the federal, that the government started sending that first round of checks to households, I would have raised interest rates from zero to 50 basis points. And I would have held that there, watched what happened, and I would have started reducing quantitative easing right then, because now you've got fiscal liquidity going directly into households, which is gonna spur demand. So second, so that, that all happened in the second quarter. Third quarter of 2020, we get a 30% bump in GDP. Immediately when that happened, I would have raised rates to 3% very quickly over the next few meetings and stop quantitative easing right there. And I wouldn't have gone tightening yet, but I would have stopped the quantitative easing at 120 billion a month. And then I would have waited to see what happened. 
because the cure, you know, the inflation was caused by all the money we sent to households. And there's some charts in that article that you're talking about showing M2 as a percentage of GDP and M2 as a percentage of debt. Those levels are still very high, but they're starting to come down, which tells you there's still a lot of that monetary support in the economy. So as the Fed, I would have said, look, the cure for high prices is high prices. So inflation is going to cause the economy to slow down, which that's happening already. And as the bank started tightening lending standards, that's also going to apply to slower economic growth because it always does. And so then I would have moderated myself a little bit. And, said, and now I've got quantitative easing out of the system, right? That, that was gone at the end of third quarter. So we wouldn't have had the big run up in the market to start with. So some of the fever would been flushed markets would have had the ability to, to really kind of gauge and monitor. Do I need to hike another point, another half point? Do I just need to pause here and see what else is happening? But, you know, he never did that. He just kept the foot on the gas for way too long. And now he's so far behind the curve that his only choice was ultimately to break something, which now he's done. Right, right. Um, that actually sounds really pragmatic. Um, obviously, you've got the benefit of 2020 hindsight here. No, 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 I said, no, I was on Charles Payne on Fox Business, November of 2020. And I said the exact same thing then. I said, if I was, if I was the Fed, I would stop this right now and, and start hiking rates. So I'm actually on record for saying this long before now. So it's not hindsight. Oh, well, that's cool. Um, and I'm amazed that Powell didn't listen to you. Jeez. I, he never listens to me. <laughs> <laughs> I email him every day, but you know, I just get, I, I just, apparently I've been blocked. So <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get your DMs, huh? Exactly. <laughs> um, so, all right. So let's, let's walk through some of the charts you talked about here um, in the article. So w one is, is that, um, Lending conditions were already in a tightening cycle before the banking crisis happened here. Right. Um, and so, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, uh, it, it seems every time that we go through a big tightening cycle like this, there is a recession that ensues. Right. Um, and of course, we just talked about how how the banks are, are going to start tightening even further from here. Um so you start this off, but but I guess, yeah, this is, I mean, this is a pretty time-honored recessionary indicator, right? Yeah, it's one of the best, actually, but it just makes perfect sense, you know, if you think about it. So, you know, we've got an economy that's dependent on debt to create growth, right? This is why we grow at 2% on average since the turn of the century. It takes more and more debt, it takes $5 worth of debt to create a dollar's worth of economic growth, give or take. So, if I'm dependent on low rates to generate the debt, because I've got to have low rates in order to borrow because I can't afford higher payments, right? That's the problem. That's the issue we've gotten ourselves in the economy. We're so dependent on, on low interest rates to afford the debt to create the growth. Then if interest rates go up, well, that slows my rate of, of borrowing. Well, and, and then if the banks turn around and choke off that lending requirement that restricts me from borrowing money even more, that gives me less money to spend because remember the households are living paycheck to paycheck. You know, we have a chart that shows the differential. It's not in this article, but I've published it before. But I have a chart that shows the differential between the amount of income that people make, their savings, and the cost of living. And the interesting thing is, is that prior to 1990, your income and your savings gave you an ability to forge your living with the surplus. So you could, between income and your savings, you could pay for your cost of living and still save some money. So that was great. Starting in 1990, it started requiring more and more debt just to sustain lifestyle. So now it's taking all of your income, all of your savings, plus some debt. We're now running at about 7,000 a year in debt just to maintain the standard of living. So all your income, all your, all your savings, and about 7,000 a year in debt. So if that's the issue, and all of a sudden I cut off that seven thousand a year in debt, and you can't get it anymore. That means you can't spend it, which means you get slower economic growth, right? So that's why lending standards are always a pre-recessionary indicator, particularly when they're spiking very sharply like they are now. Okay, um, I want to combine that recessionary indicator with um, some of your comments on M two, yeah. right? So uh, so M two is declining. Um, this is really one of the first times ever. 
for that M2 has declined like this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, if I'm reading your analysis here correctly, you know, you're saying, look, we're, we're the, the impact of that has been masked so far largely by the amount of stimulus pig that's still in the Python and hasn't made its way out yet. Right. But as it does, as it begins to exit the Python here and that buffer is not there anymore, we're really going to start like feeling and noticing increasingly the impact of that that notable decrease in M2. Um, and, uh, you know, more money supply that's out there, the more, you know, yeah. monetary velocity there should be. And I mean, there's just more activity that should happen as you start draining the pond less things can happen. It kind of makes sense. So you have uh, this comment here I just want you to react to. Uh, of course, today's debate is whether these recession indicators are wrong for the first time since 1974. As stated above, the massive surge in monetary stimulus as a percentage of GDP remains highly elevated, which gives the illusion the economy is more robust than it likely is. As the lag effect of monetary tightening takes hold later this year, so this is again the importance of the lag effect, the reversion in economic strength will probably surprise most economists. So it seems like this sort of, you know, buffer factor that the, the pig and the python has been playing to the decrease in M2 is, is something that not a lot of people are paying a ton of attention to. Yeah, you know, and, and, and by the way, that sounds a lot better when you read it back to me than when I wrote it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Happy you know, to be your narrator anytime. I know it's just, it's just it's, it's, when you write this stuff, I'm like, okay, I think that sounds right. When you read it back, it sounds a lot better. Um, so, but no, th that's the whole point about this is is that you know there's two things that are occurring in the, in the economy right now that I don't think a lot of economists have really grappled with, which is that you know when that money you and so so let me back up one second here because this goes back to quantitative easing and and how it works in the economy. If you go back and look at, at, at monetary velocity, there was no monetary velocity caused by QE, right? So because QE is just a swap of assets between banks and the Federal Reserve. What's happening right now is you are starting to, to, to further erode monetary velocity as because, again, what you need for monetary velocity is, you know, that's how fast money moves through the system. That means that the money's created. It then goes to the banks, and then the banks then lend it out to people, right? So that's how it flows through this. And then, of course, they do whatever. They're, they're going to start a business. And they're going to pay people. They go put their money into the bank, and then that bank then makes another loan based on those savings deposits, which that's monetary velocity. We don't have any, right? And, and monetary velocity has been declining now, and really ever since the turn of the century, which tells you that the economic transmission system itself is flawed. There's something wrong with the transmission system of the economy, which is why you have this big wealth gap, right, between the top 10 and the bottom 90% of people. So that's the one thing that nobody's really paying attention to and addressing. And so we, we, we've really kind of, you know, skewed things because we sent checks directly to households. So all of a sudden we bypassed the bank, sent money directly to households, which causes this massive surge in M2 in terms of its percentage of the economy. Now that's all working its way back out of the system as, as we talked about. So when that erodes, that's gonna even further erode the, the velocity of money through the system. And again, so if you thought the, the financial system was fractured before, it's completely broken now. So on that point, um, Lacey Hunt spoke at our conference this past Saturday and uh, he talked about, you know, showing a bright spotlight on the decline in monetary velocity. Um, as you can see, there's a little uptick in the past, you know, year and a half, two years from the fiscal stimulus, right? And he said, that's not going to last. That, that, right. re that's going to revert real quick. Um, and he said, the problem with this is that um, because the debt burden is so big now and velocity is, is just continuing to fall, you know, into a chasm, he said, increasingly, it's going to get harder and harder for the Fed's efforts to generate any sort of response in the economy. So when the Fed, you know, when we get through inflation and we're now fighting deflation again, um, and the Fed wants to return to stimulate the economy and it, it takes out its bazooka and starts firing it, 
he said, you're going to see less and less impact from that. And he, he compared it to, he basically said that the, the string is getting looser and looser. So the Fed is pushing on this increasingly loose string where it, it's going to push hard, but not much is actually going to transpire on the other end. Yeah, you're nodding no, as I'm saying this. Yeah, no, he's absolutely right. And we've, I've written articles about, he's, he's done, we both have done the same thing. Um, but, you know, if you look at each round of quantitative easing going back to 2009, the first round of quantitative easing was a trillion dollars, right? Uh, and, you know, it sounds like a lot, you know, back then it was. But then quantitative, quantitative, quantitative easing part two, it had to be bigger. Three had to be bigger. Four was 120 billion a month. So the next round of quantitative easing to get a, the, so in each one of these rounds of quantitative easing created, you know, a, a asset response. It took more and more money to create the same asset response each time. And, and to your point, that that string or you know however, whatever metaphor you want to use, but it's taking more and more monetary policy to affect a similar amount of asset response within the system. And and there's going to be a point that the Federal Reserve is going to hit the system with liquidity, and there's going to be no response. Now that that's not going to be next. That might be that may be QE ten. By the time we get there, but there is going to be a point to where the Fed's going to do QE and the asset markets are not going to respond. Yeah, and that's that. That I mean, that's when you really know you're at the end game, right? Yeah. Where there's just they're they're out of ammo, right? Well, um, look, and Bank of Japan's a good example of this, right? I mean, yeah. they're 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 at that end game and stuff they're doing now, uh, trying to do yield curve control and other stuff. It's just not working. So yeah, all right, well. Don't want to get folks too depressed here, but obviously that's that's the risk we run at the current trajectory. Um, I do want to put up your chart here of uh, monetary velocity and household debt just to show that the two are very correlated, um, sort of inversely, right? And as you said, Lance, just more and more people um, are having to borrow to make ends meet these days, right? So, you know, the household debt problem just doesn't seem to be, I mean, I don't think there's any good reason to expect that that number to... To reverse, yeah. <laughs> let alone even slow, right? It's kind of got that exponential growth to it, right? Yeah, um, just, so that's what we got. Again, just, no, I was just going to say, again, just goes back to the fact that, you know, it was very interesting when Joe Biden, uh, right after he was elected, he did $1.4 in stimulus. Another round of stimulus checks. That, oh, it's $1.9 trillion, sorry, $1,400 checks to households. And, you know, and it was interesting then because he, he made the statement that we're going to put, you know, we're going to we're going to get 20 percent of the population out of poverty. And so I wrote an article It's on our website. You can go check it out. I said, this is going to reduce poverty for one year. And that's exactly what happened. And, and right. you can even see in that in that chart that I have that shows the gap between how much credit is required to sustain standard of living. It actually went positive for one quarter. And so all of a sudden, for one quarter, people had plenty of money that just out of wages and savings, they could sustain their standard of living. And then it went right to a record low after that. So all those so all those people that got out of poverty for 12 months are right back into it now with a whole bunch more with them. Right. Because right. that's yeah, it's, it's, it's like a sugar high. I mean, it's what yeah, it was yeah. sort of a fiscal, fiscal sugar high. Exactly right. And, and uh, this is the whole problem with modern monetary theory. By the way, what happened to Stephanie Kelton? Um, I have not seen hide nor hair of her. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that's right. And for folks who don't know, she was a big proponent of it. Yeah, you know, the, but the, but it was a flawed theory because her whole theory was is that government government debt was households assets, and in theory, on the balance sheet, that works that way. But that's not the way it works in real life. Right. And and you know, and so again, we found out the flaws of modern monetary theory is is that you get inflation, and to her and and to her credit, right? To her credit, she said. When you do modern monetary theory, when you get inflation, you have to raise taxes. But nobody wants to raise taxes, right? right. Nobody wants to do the things to, but that's what reverses the, the inflation, the modern monetary theory. You have to raise taxes. So as, as usual, and this goes to every president going back to Reagan, so it's not Democrat or Republican, it's every president, is that Keynes' theory on, on monetary policy is that when you have a recession, the government steps in with spending, until the economy comes out of recession, then the government goes back to surplus to prepare for the next recession. Well, all the politicians ever heard since Reagan was spend more money. Right. That's, right. that's all they've heard. And that's why we just keep getting bigger and bigger debts and deficits, which drag on economic growth, increases poverty, 
And, you know, and, and this is why we are where we are today. Right. No, everybody loves the sugar. Nobody likes the broccoli. Right. <laughs> exactly. Neither, right. Joe, he didn't like the broccoli either, apparently. So. <laughs> but senior. But senior. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I just want to finish out your article here because you've got some other great charts. Um, you've got some uh, leading indicator charts, um, some from establishment surveys and, and, and then RIA's own proprietary uh, leading indicators as well. Um, almost doesn't matter which one we look at. I mean, they both tell the same story, right? Okay. Which is that, hey, at readings like this in the past, we've been at, in recessions. And so um, anything else to say about this? No, it, it's just, it, you know, it, it is interesting that you, you know, you have a very vocal media right now and, and very vocal Wall Street that's this whole, you know, non-recession camp. We're going to avoid the recession. Maybe. And again, I, you know, when, you know, we have to play possibilities and probabilities as we always talk about, right? You can't just say, oh, I'm going to be all in, in, in gold and beanie weenies because we're definitely having a recession. We might not. I mean, but as I've said before, you know, I can't see a way on that you don't want something. And, and frankly, with the Fed hiking rates and you know, looking at the bank tightening situation and what's going on, I don't see how you get a fairly decent recession out of this, which if that is the case, earnings estimates have to come down, prices have to adjust for lower earnings, which means valuations have to come down. And so there's a very high correlation between these leading economic indicators and S&P earnings. And those indicators are saying that earnings have to come down more. So from an investment standpoint, again, you know, we can't guarantee this because there are no guarantees in investing, but it certainly looks like that the odds of the S&P achieving new record high in earnings by the end of next year is a pretty far-fetched probability. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the message that I want people to take from your article, whether they read it or just listen to this discussion, is it's kind of one of these like the status quo is going to change, right? Which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, right now we all are told and think, oh, the job market's still really robust and the markets are hanging in there at 4,000 and um, we might have a soft landing. Like, you know, everything is still hanging together right now, but your indicators are saying, no, economically, the probability is we're going to be in recession in the not too distant future. Um, and there's a lot of things here that, you know, if you're right, Lance, a lot of shoes are going to drop. They're going to make next year feel pretty different. Next year this time feel pretty different year this time. So if Powell is not able to tell people, hey, prepare for the coming storm, you know, that's the message I want folks to get from here. And, and like you said, we don't know for sure if this is what's going to happen, but we think that this is the most likely outcome, right? So plan for that and then hedge your hedge is, is what if that doesn't occur, right? <laughs> well, I think and there's one other difference. You know, we often, you know, people, uh, you know, Jeremy Grantham once said that, you know, this time is different as the most dangerous words in investing. Right. There is a difference this time. Um, and, and I caution when I say that just, but there is a difference. Normally, when the Fed starts a rate hiking campaign, markets tend to do okay, right? So initially, when the Fed is hiking rates, markets tend to go up because, the Fed's hiking rates, it's not enough to cause a real issue. Generally, the economy is humming along and as right. it is. Well, the, the Fed is hiking rates because usually it's worried about the economy overheating, yeah, right? So yeah, things exactly. are going pretty good, right, from an exactly. asset standpoint. Exactly. And so, so stock prices tend to go up. This has been a very different last year. Last year, the economy was actually doing quite okay. Um, earnings were you know, not completely disastrous. They actually came in better than expected uh, from the original estimates. And yet the market sold off by 20%. So this is going to be, and, and again, you know, everybody's predicting recession, which is the one thing that always bothers me, right? right? Yeah. And yeah. And investing in the fact that every, everybody's predicting one. So, you know, one of the questions I think we have to ask ourselves is, is, is saying, has the market corrected enough to adjust for a mild recession, right? Potentially. And, and I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. Or did the market anticipate the recession? So when we actually get the recession. The market says, oh, OK, here's the recession. We've already kind of priced that in. So we're good. And maybe stocks don't go down as much as expected. Now, again, you know, 
as with gold, it's as I said earlier, if you're gonna, if you're buying gold, then all you need to care about is is real yields, inflation adjusted yields. That's all that matters with gold. If you're buying stocks, what matters is is earnings estimates, forward earnings estimates, and where those are headed. So if the market is right and earnings are going to start to improve, whether or not we're in a recession, I don't still don't see how we get there, but that's the the question. Then markets could hold in here, right? Maybe we've seen the lows that maybe October were the lows of the market, and we don't have another down leg. Maybe we just go nowhere for the next twelve months. Maybe it's just a very frustrating up and down period for twelve months, and you're just going to be a really good stock picker to make some money. You know, I don't have the answer to that, but you know, it does. It does. You know, there is enough there. You can look at all these indicators across the board. There's enough there to suggest that earnings have to weaken, and if they do weaken more. Prices and valuations have to adjust accordingly. Have to now, adjust that accordingly. Doesn't that, that doesn't mean 50%, right? Because we've already knocked out 20% or so. But, you know, it could be another 15, 20% to the downside. Yeah. Um, you end the piece with a, a chart that's just worth noting for a moment, too, which is that periods of high inflation are followed historically by periods of deflation, right? right? Um, we've now had the high inflation. We're now in disinflation, at least as measured by CPI and the, the government reported stats. Um, so unless it is truly different this time, um, you know, at some point here, we're, we're going to go through a period of contraction, right? So, you know, again, it's, it's just adding additional wind behind the sails of your primary recessionary thesis here. Right. Yeah. And again, I, you know, I wish I could tell you, you know, the only thing, and, and again, I know it sounds like I'm wishy-washy and, I, and I'm... Um, I, this is my best version of Alan Greenspeak. You know, <laughs> what, what I don't want to tell you is that, oh, yeah, we'll definitely have a recession. Markets are going to have 50%. Go hide out in cash. Yep. We, we all get it. You're not saying yeah. that. You know, I'm not, I, I don't want you to do that. You know, the important thing here is, is that we just need to, to understand what we're dealing with and adapt to it accordingly. Right. So if you think it's going to rain, you carry an umbrella. Maybe it doesn't rain. But I still got the umbrella just in case, right? Yeah, so absolutely. as investing, that's how we need to approach this. Again, you know, nothing looks good. I'm not, you know, I'm not bullish. I'm not bearish. I'm I'm just trying to weigh all my odds, but you know, and, and trying to navigate as I be, as best I can. Look, we're very overweight cash. We're you know underweight duration in bonds right now. You know, we're as conservative as we can be, but still have a, a toe in the water to participate if this market begins to rally, and then we'll put more money to work. Yeah. And let, let me help you in that too, which is, you know, you, I don't think your message has ever been on this channel since I've been interviewing you of, you know, time to get in the bunker and, you know, just uh, hold your breath. Um, you and I have had lots of discussions around the, the types of sort of storm clouds, I guess you could say we're talking about here. And what I've been hearing clearly from you and your partner, Mike Leibowitz there is it's a time to be defensively inclined and prioritize, um, you know, high quality assets. Yeah. Right. So it's not no assets. It's just you really want to be high on the quality scale right now. And there will hopefully be a time where you can transfer out of those into the more speculative asset classes once better valuations, you know, are, arrive uh, after the excesses are flushed out of the system. Right. Yeah. And but, that'll, be you know, exactly, you, you, that'll be exactly the time that you don't want to do that. But that'll be when you need to. Right. So sorry, repeat that. Right. So when it comes time to buy those speculative assets, right, yeah. it'll be when they're all broken. And and you're and, and psychologically and emotionally, you're like, I'm not buying that because it's going to zero. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, but that'll be the time you want to buy distressed debt. You want to buy junk yields. You want to buy broken companies. You want to buy all those things because they're going to be real values and real opportunities there. Because every if we get into an environment where you have a real sell off in the markets, and you have this recessionary kind of reversion in the economy and the markets itself, you know, all asset prices are going to come lower because it'll be baby with the bathwater out the window. People will just indiscriminately sell everything. But that'll be when you'll be the most afraid, but that'll be the time that you want to start buying. Great. And, and when you and when feel, that happens, we'll be here doing it. <laughs> exactly. When you feel that time is right, we'll be here and we'll be holding people's hands to say, I know it seems a little scary, but this is the time yeah. where you, you, you deploy for the long haul. Um, all right, great. Well, look, um, I want to just read your conclusion to the piece because I, I thought it was a, a good conclusion. And um, since you enjoy hearing your uh, work read back to you, I thought you'd like it. Um, 
Okay. Historically, periods of Fed tightening have never had a positive outcome on earnings, and it likely won't this time either. That is particularly the case when the Fed breaks something. While this time could be different from an investing standpoint, I wouldn't bet my retirement on that point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Is so I think that's the key takeaway from here, which is like, you know, there are some reasons that maybe it is different this time, but you're saying not enough to make you want to put the important things at risk on it. Exactly. And look, you know, we, you know, and as I said, Jim, there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of money invested in the markets because, you know, if you have time for, you know, I got an interesting email today um, because last week we we're talking about, uh, you know, using life insurance to make loans. And I said, if I was young again, if I was, you know, 25 and just starting out, first thing I do is I fully fund my 401k plan. Then I overfund a life insurance policy and then I put money into the stock market. And so a guy emailed me and he's like, hey, I heard, heard what you said. So, but how would you allocate the 401k plan? Well, if I'm 25 years old, I put 100% in the S&P 500, just contribute to that every week and done with it, right? Don't even pay attention to it because in 30 years, it's going to be higher, right? And, and uh, you know, the problem is, is that we spend, and, and this is this is the media's fault. This is Wall Street's fault. This is Robin Hood's fault. You know, we put all these tools in your hands where we can track everything real time. And that makes us make all these emotional decisions that wind up being wrong. And, right. you know, we need to have a longer term time frame on our investments. We need to allow things to work over time. And so half part of your money invested in the markets and good quality assets that doesn't matter whether they go up or down, right? Just over time, they're going to pay you out because they're paying a dividend yield or they've got good quality fundamentals, et cetera. Um, there's a good company. We own a company right now called CVS, which is uh, CVS Healthcare. That stock has gotten hammered. In the last month is down 16%. And there's really no news driving that particular decline, except as part of what's been happening with this rotation within the markets. And that's awesome, right? We've owned this company for a long time, and I'm about to buy a whole bunch more of it, right? Because this is one of those quality assets, PE of eight, dividend yield, strong payouts, earnings grow every year, and we're all getting older. So we're all going to be spending more money buying drugs at the, at the, health, at the, at the store. Um, so this is one of those companies. I'm, I'm not recommending you buy this. I'm not making a recommendation. I'm just telling you a story, right? So just that's my disclaimer. <laughs> I'm not giving you advice. But my point is, is this is a company that I'm confident for my clients that I can own for the next 20 years. I'm not worried about it. Um, you know, there, there, there are plenty of stories in history. You know, Apple, Microsoft. There was I read a great article the other day. Um, one of the original uh, owners of Microsoft stock, he owned 10%, uh, sorry, uh, of Apple. He owned 10% of Apple and he sold his 10% stake in Apple for $800. Today, that's worth $52 billion. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever feel bad about an investment loss, just remember that story. So Think about that guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but you know, there, there, are, there are companies that you can invest in and it doesn't matter whether they go up or down or sideways or whatever. You just keep buying them every time they give you a good opportunity. There's other companies like um, Block, which is, used to be called Square. You know, now it's under under short sell uh, pressure because of Hindenburg Research. You know, that's a young company. Uh, it may be the next payment system. It may have been. It might be the next PayPal or the next Visa or the next Mastercard. I don't know. It doesn't have a long enough history to tell you. But there are companies that are more speculative in nature that you can own short term, and you trade those opportunities in your portfolio but you have a portion of your portfolio that's just there for the long term and let that portion work for you. Let it just pay you dividends. Let it pay you that passive income while you own it. Don't worry about the price moving up and down. Don't panic over it. That's a portion of your core holdings in your portfolio. Then have a piece that's over here that's more speculative that you trade. And that's okay. Great. And, and hey, by the way, just so don't forget, um, we told people after you described the, the whole life solution that you used to say if they see if they wanted to see a, a webinar really going into the mechanics of how it all works. Pretty resounding yes, Lance. So we're going to have to do that soon. <laughs> all right. I'll put it together for you. All right. Well, look, I'm getting to your trades, but real quick before I do, let me just go through housing and and uh, and, and the layoff situation because um, we, we like to update folks on those every week. Um, on the housing side, sort of two things for you this week. One is just Going back to this, okay, the banks are going to be now tightening lending standards even more than they were. Um, uh, it seems unavoidable that that's going to 
put some an additional chill on the housing market, right? Because you're going to have basically fewer people who are going to be qualifying for loans. If they qualify, they're not going to qualify necessarily for as large of a mortgage as they were before. Um, and in general, you tighten credit restrictions and generally, you know, yield rates are going up, uh, you know, to compensate for the additional risk. So it just seems like it's throwing additional sand in the gears of, of the housing machine, which is already kind of slowing right now. Do you see the same? Well, yeah. And, and again, you know, I want to go back. So so two things. First of all, yes. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that, you know, you've had a drop in interest rates and you actually had a pretty decent uptick in uh, contracts as well as mortgage applications in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's still a lot of people willing and wanting to buy a house. Um, but it's also very location specific. You know, again, we talk about, you know, nationally, you know, prices may come down 20, 30 percent, whatever. I got an email last week from a person that lives in Florida and they're like, man, we're trying to buy a house. But every time a house comes up on market, it's gone. Right. I mean, it's just and it's going in ass. And, you know, and, 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 so, sorry to interrupt, but it's funny because I've gotten emails like that from people in Florida. I've also gotten emails from people in Florida saying, oh, my God, it's really drying up here. So, I mean, it's it's highly and, local everywhere. Right. Exactly. That's my exact point. And, and so, you know, here and, and I can just talk about Houston because this is where I live, you know, you know, on. So Houston's like a donut. Right. And so Houston's like the Houston Metro is the center of and around the woodlands land and those areas. Well, once you get to the outskirts, there's just land. We live in Texas, right? So yes. <laughs> there's, there's no restriction. You can keep there, going. There, there is land as far as you can see. <laughs> so yeah, you can just keep building. Uh, this house is too expensive. There's a piece of vacant property right there. You just build a house on that, right? So once you're out in the suburbs, you know, so, so those house prices are starting to fall a bit. But in Houston, where you're landlocked and inventory is tight, I was just talking to a guy. So as you know, I bought a house this week. And I was just, so we met the we, we've got to do a lot of renovation to it. So we met the contractor today to you know start talking about the renovation work. And he lives in the neighborhood where we bought this house. He says, yeah, a house just came up, it came available yesterday and it had 12 offers on it in 37 minutes. So, you know, at, at full at full ask. And that's the way this particular area is one. Um, Houston proper is a high crime city. Right. It's, it's right up. To, it's not quite Baltimore or Chicago yet, but, you know, we've got a lot of problem with the, with Democratic DAs here. Um, we've got a lot of problems with, you know, letting people off on parole with, you know, that are, have massively long criminal records. So crime's a real problem in, in Houston proper. But and there's these little pockets like in this particular neighborhood that we just bought this house where the school districts are really, really good. They're very safe. They have very low crime. And so everybody wants to live there. So as soon as a house comes up, there's somebody there to buy it. Multiples right. of people trying to buy it because they want to get their kids into these schools and out of HISD. So, so again, if you're looking for a house, there's kind of really three things to consider. First, consider what's happening with the overall housing market. Don't, don't, don't disregard that entirely because that does have an impact on what's happening. As, as interest rates go up and as money tightens, it is going to cause housing to slow down everywhere to some degree. But the second thing is also remember, this is the house. So unless this is an investment property, right? This is your home. This is where you're going to live for seven to 10 years on average. So even if you pay a little bit too much for it right now, and, and the market does, so you, you pay for this house, you think you got a good deal, but then housing prices decline some. In seven to 10 years of you living in this house, you're going to wind up you know, with a higher price just due to inflation, if nothing else. Right. Right. But this is your home. It's not an investment. So don't try to, you know, too many people are trying to just, I'm trying to get the exact bottom, right? It, 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 real estate's very tough to do that in. So buy a good quality property in a good quality neighborhood in a safe area that people want to be in. And that will ensure that it maintains value over time. And then lastly is, you know, you know, be sure, as we talked about before, put a big chunk of a down payment on it. Don't try to buy a house with, you know, I, I could, you know, Here's the price of the house, and I can only come up with a three percent down payment because that's all the money I can save. And you're trying to buy a house you really can't afford. Don't do that because that's where you get in trouble, and you're wind up forced to sell the house at the worst possible time to get out from under the mortgage. So be sensible about how you approach your your, your housing uh, in terms of where you're going to live. Now, investment properties are entirely different, right? So that's a different conversation we can have. But you know, it's just important. It's always about real estate. 
always and forever, location, location, location. That's that's the key, the three keys to buying houses, it's location. Okay. Um... Uh, good point. I don't think you necessarily addressed the point I mentioned, though, about the the, the additional bank lending tightening. I mean, do, yeah. do, do you do you see that as having a material well, impact in yeah, the near term yeah. here? Yeah, that's what I said. Is that you know, there, because of what's going on, we could see, you could buy a house today and then prices come down a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, but they're going to do that without this banking crisis that we had. We were already on that. <laughs> Good. Yes. Um, but like I said, you know, there's going to be some areas in housing that don't come down in price a, a, because they didn't run up as much either. So, you know, if you're buying out in San Diego or San Francisco or, you know, some of the places in California, New York, others where you have these massive price increases, those are going to come down a lot. Houston, the prices never really ran up that much. We didn't have that big of an inflation to start with. So they're not going to come down as much. Yeah. OK, well, let me let me um, let me ask you this, too. So. In cities where, um, you know, we had housing analyst Nick Jurley speak at the uh, the conference, um, and he did a lot of great charts. Um, and he talked about how, um, you know, the sort of like tight inventory nationwide narrative is largely a myth. And you've you've weighed in on this too, um, which is there's there's a lot of inventory that'll 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 come on the market, you know, uh, in certain conditions. Um, uh, so the the very popular markets, um, you know, the developers, they respond to incentives, right? I mean, they've been building houses like crazy in a lot of these markets, and um, a lot of the inventory was kind of kind of marooned during the pandemic, where a lot of it was waiting on, you know, either construction workers couldn't come and work on site, or the house was almost done, but a key component was stuck in China and hadn't arrived yet, right? <laughs> well, so yeah. all that inventory is starting to flood the market now. Um, while prices are beginning to cool. So it, it's kind of worsening the situation, right? Um, but uh, you know, what he was saying is, is they've got all these projects in the pipeline. And even if the market's cooling, they don't make any money from an unfinished project, right? right? So they're not going to start new projects necessarily, but they are going to keep finishing every project they have in there, right? And they're going to start having discounts and you know incentives and all this stuff. We're beginning to see all that. So, you know, it that that seems to spell trouble for the markets where there's a lot of developer activity, right? Because you're going to have a lot of inventory continuing to flood the market right as prices are coming down. Kind of a perfect storm. What's so interesting to me, though, is that I just checked right before this interview. If you look at the three biggest home builders in America, if you look at their stocks, two of them, um, uh, Pulte, and I'm trying to remember the other one, it's... Uh, uh, Sky View Champion or uh, Skyline Champion, they're at their all time highs. The third one, Toll Brothers, is just below it, right? Yeah, so, Toll Brothers, your head. Yeah, Toll Brothers, NVR. We, uh, Mike and I just had this conversation this morning. We were just talking so about are these. Are these great shorts for somebody that's inclined to short? You know, it's it's an interesting dichotomy. I can, I don't understand why they're at all time highs. Um, you know, because of exactly what you're saying, right? And that's what I was saying, like, in, in Houston, where I bought this house, you can't build any new, there is no new inventory. These houses were all built in the 60s. There is no new, there is no building of new inventory. There's no land to build it on, right? So, but you go out to Katy, there's whole home divisions that are getting built out there, right? So if you go somewhere and you see a bunch of houses under construction, just wait. You'll get that, you're going to get that house a lot cheaper before this is over, right? Because they're going to they're gonna try to move that inventory. Why the hell these home builders are trading at all-time highs? I really don't have a clue. You know, I can't say go short them because if they were going to die, they would, should have died last year. So I don't know what's driving those prices higher, why people are chasing them, because it seems as if there's a good bet of downside risk to those guys. Um, as you know, and because you're, you're absolutely correct, is that all these projects they started, they've got to finish them. And that's going to lead to a supply glut at some point. Multifamily homes, we've talked about this before, too. The number of multifamily construction units is at an all-time record. Uh, you know, there's just not enough people to rent that much inventory. Those prices are going to come down dramatically. So, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of risk in the overall market that, from an investment standpoint, you know, you almost have to say those are good shorting opportunities. I'm just surprised that they haven't worked to this point. To this point, okay. Well, it may be, you know. The wild coyote moment where the coyote's hovering in midair in midair. And as an investor, you may be able to still catch him before gravity kicks in. 
Um, what office, I'll say, Lance, his, is his office rates are declining sharply, right? So that yeah. that thesis worked out well because we yeah, say those the market got the memo and those guys, yeah. yeah. Um, gosh, one thing we didn't talk about um, was the whole risk to banks from uh, commercial real estate loans because that's, that's the smaller small banks small. own a crap ton of it, right? They, 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 almost every other loan type is substantially owned more by the the big ten banks, right? But not in the case with commercial real estate loans because yes. lending is often done so locally um, yeah. around properties, um, and so that's a really big additional shoe that's like highly likely going to hit the. Um, the bank, the smaller regional banks, as well, will be defaults uh, on auto loans. And we had Lucky Lopez talking about that at the conference. I mean, that's going to be another, you know, conflagration that's going to be going through that part of the credit market. Um, yeah. But re real quick, though, let me just ask if anybody is watching this who works in the real estate industry, who knows of a compelling reason why those home building stocks I mentioned should not be candidates for shorts. Mention in the comment section below. I'd, I'd really like to, to know. So Lance and I aren't saying go out and short those stocks today. You know, we're not making a recommendation on that, but we are saying it's probably worth investigating. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, one of the things that, you know, is also kind of conflating the whole supply demand of the market is that if I live in a house and my mortgage is 4%, why would I sell it to go get a 7% mortgage? Right? You got to live somewhere. So, you know, one of the things that's, you know, so two things are happening. One is on one side, you've got people going, I can't afford a 7% mortgage, so I'm not going to buy a house. And you got a whole bunch of people sitting in their homes going, well, I'm not going to sell because I don't want a 7% mortgage. So right, this, is, but this is also why the number of cash transactions have been rising sharply over the last six months. In fact, there's been a huge pickup and the number of homes being purchased for all cash because of that, right? I can sell my house at a premium and then go buy a new house for all cash and I don't have a 7% mortgage. Right, right. I'm wondering, I don't know, but is that is that mostly, uh, is that mostly like boomers downsizing, right? Could because be, presumably but, you sell your house, most people still have some mortgage on it, right? So you're not getting 100% of the sale value, but you're buying 100% of a smaller house at this yeah, point. That, that's what I did. Um, that's yeah. what my wife and I did, right? We sold our house, we're, we're downsizing. And so we paid all cash for this new house. Okay, um, boomer. Yeah, I am. A, uh, I am as, as expected. So, but, you know, but the point is, is that, you know, the people that are selling, you know, they are buying in all cash. There's a, there's a very large number of transactions that are now that are all cash versus mortgages. So, you know, the, the, the differential now now, once mortgages come down, that'll be interesting to see, you know, how fast this picks up. But like I said, just last week, when mortgage rates fell to, you know, I forgot what they fell to last week, but, you know, we were down to 3.6% on the 10-year yield. I think we we're at 3.5 or something today. Um, you know, that's bringing mortgage rates down and we saw a pickup in activity. So even small changes to mortgage rates are dragging buyers into the market. Right, going, right. This may be the best I get. Yeah, well, exactly. And I wonder, like, how short lived is that? Right? Is that is that people who have just they're just desperate to buy, or they're they're still clinging on hope that things are going to get better oh. soon? Um, because the housing market is oftentimes a lot like the bear market in stocks, right? But with the time you get to a housing market bottom, like nobody wants to buy. <laughs> well, and, and again, you know, with, with and, and like for me, and and this is going to be most of cash buyers, right? I'm not going to you know pay cash entirely, right? So again, I borrowed against my insurance policy, paid right. cash. You're borrowing from yourself, yeah. Yeah, and I've invested in the cash I, I got from selling my house. I invested that at a much higher rate. So you know, I'm just playing an arbitrage right now. But you know, at, at some point, you know, I will refinance the whole project into a 30 year mortgage, right? And, right. and just and, and then get my interest rate, get my mortgage interest deduction get my cash back so I can redeploy that at a higher rate somewhere else. So there are going to be a lot of cash buyers that are just waiting for rates to come down to refinance. So you'll see a big mortgage refinance boom. So at some point, you know, you want to start looking at mortgage refinancing companies and, you know, companies that, that buy mortgages, those type of things, because there'll be a, a decent arbitrage there as well. Right. But probably not until you see... I know. Whites of the, yeah, you see whites of the eyes first. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look, I'm looking at the time. I realize we get to dial through a number of things here. So let me just touch on layoffs super briefly, which is just to say, say hey, they're still continuing, right? You know, they were in the headlines. Then the banking crisis kind of took everything over. But layoffs have been continuing uh, all along. Um, I'm going to put up a chart here real quick of tech layoffs. Um, 
they're pretty generous in how they describe tech uh, in, in this particular accounting. But um, you'll see here that uh, Q1 of this year is the highest uh, quarter in the data system uh, for layoffs. And that's including the whole pandemic period, you know, where we shut down the economy and we, we had those tremendous layoffs uh, for a short period of time. Um, so just to show the magnitude that, hey, look, you know, this is this is building and is now at the the the, the biggest magnitude in recent history. Um, I just want to mention a couple of names here that are laying off just to underscore that they're it's just not tech companies anymore. As we keep talking about the contagion is spreading. Uh, Accenture, a big management consulting firm, has laid off. Um, uh, this can't be right. I've got 190. I think it's 19,000. They've laid off. They, they've announced that they're laying off 19,000 people. Um, recruiters, Indeed and Glassdoor, are both laying off 15% uh, of staff. That's a several thousand people. Uh, and Amazon, uh, who just laid off 18,000 workers in January, uh, it just announced that they're going to lay off another 9,000. Right. So, um, as you and I have been predicting, Lance, um, this drumbeat's just going to continue, um, especially because. Companies have been in, in labor hoarding mode. And as you've said many times, they want to do everything they can before they let go of those workers because they had to work hard to get them. They've been trying to keep them. Um, you know, we're, we're, the, the tide is still rising here in the layoffs, but I don't think we're, we're anywhere near, you know, if, if your article is right about the coming recession, you know, we're probably, to mix my metaphors here, we're probably still in, you know, maybe the bottom of inning one, maybe the top of inning two, right? Yeah, I, I, um, I agree. Okay. All right. Um, so trades, Lance, um, you said you guys have actually been adding exposure this week because of the buy signals. What actual trades have you made? Um, so basically real small, right? So as always, you know, when, when we get a buy signal, it's, you know, we want to just kind of step in and, and test the water a bit. So all we did this week was buy a little bit of the triple Q NASDAQ because tech has been leading the charge all year. And so all the momentums in the tech side, the reason is, is that if the economy is going to slow down, if you're going to have a recession, then you're looking for companies that can grow earnings in a weaker economic environment. That's tech. So uh, triple Q is going to be well. However, value and you know banking stocks, energy stocks have been under a tremendous amount of pressure. So we counterbalanced a potential rotation between tech and other areas of the markets by also adding in a small portion of RSP, which is the S&P 500 equal weight. So we just did two little starter positions there. Um, we're on a buy signal. The market finished, you know, uh, positive on Friday. That was great. So everything's working like it's supposed to. And then, you know, next week, if this market starts to gain a little bit of traction, uh, I would love to see the market get above the 50-day moving average. And if it does that, then we'll increase those position sizes and start adding individual stocks uh, to our portfolio. Okay. Uh, as the market, let's say the market has a, another week next week, like it had this week, where it kind of closes kind of where it started here. Does stabilization like that help or hurt? Uh, is that bullish or bearish from bullish. a technical standpoint? No, it's, it's bullish, actually. So uh, two ways that, look, we've had a big run since the beginning of the year, don't forget, right? So you go back and look at the October lows where we started this rally. We've been rallying for October, November, December, January, February, right? So five months of this rally, and now the market's just been really consolidating now for a month or so, kind of working off those overbought conditions, working off those indicators. Again, you go back to, to February, we wrote the article saying, hey, the correction may have started. We were very overbought. We got a MACD sell signal from a high level. Now those, those levels are very low and turning up. So you know, if the market spends another week or so just consolidating, going nowhere, um, when the market's not going up or down, that means that buyers are meeting sellers. When markets are moving up, that means that there's more buyers and sellers. When markets are going down, there's more sellers and buyers. So as long as there's a happy medium and there's you know people are meeting each other, then that's that's good. That's actually bullish. Okay. Um, another question is: Last week you revealed that you guys had started um, adding to your positions or increasing your position. You, you, you'd started moving further out the yield curve yep. um, on your treasuries. Right. Um, and as I understand it, you were you were you know still in the early stages of doing that. You know, if you look back at yields over the past couple of weeks, like they've fallen a lot. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my question is, is like for, for folks, and I'll include myself in this camp, 
who were really looking forward to the green light to just push out long on the the, the, the credit curve, you know, in treasuries, a really safe environment. Um, did we kind of miss the window? I mean, has it already happened? No. Um, yields are very overbought right now. In fact, you're very close to trigger a sell signal on yields. So if, and so this is all kind of lining up. You've got a buy signal on stock, sell signal on yields. What that suggests is, is that we're about to get a rally in the markets a bit here. Now, again, that doesn't mean we're about to start the next great bull market run. It's just the way technicals and markets work. Um, should get a little bit of a pickup in the markets, a little bit of relief now that we're through the FOMC meeting where there's an end of the pivot. And over the next few days, I'm certain we're going to get more talk from Yellen and you know we're going to have bank stability. I'll be fine. So any bit of good news here, this market's going to rally a bit. Well, that's also going to potentially drive yields up a bit. Um, people will sell risk, uh, risk-free risk assets, treasuries, to move back into the stock market. So that's how that'll work. So I think on like TLT as an example, you get around 105, you start buying. And, you know, anything below 105, you start buying a lot. Um, you know, so so again, you know, we're in that those early phases of that potential turn and rates coming down as you get into the recession, as inflation comes down, as the economy slows down. That's what drives you along into the curve. So there's still plenty of, I mean, you know, literally you could go in a day and put your whole money in TLT and that would be fine. I wouldn't do it because you're going to wind up, if you wait a little bit, get a little bit better price, right? So just, yeah. if you have no exposure by a little bit, if you have some, just wait, I think you have a better opportunity. All right. L- let me ask you to speculate here for a second. <laughs> okay. Is the peak in yields already behind us? Yes. That's not speculation. That's a, I get, and there's no guarantees in life. But if you said, okay, you have to guarantee something, I guarantee you that the, the peak in yields is probably behind us. Okay, so you, you see a little bit of a, in, 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 you, you see one more, at least one more kind of run up in yields, but not to where we were. Yeah, we, you just, so ago. if you look at a chart on yields, right, you're starting to make that topping process. So, you know, and, and look, there's no guarantees in life. You know, could we, could something happen and we have another run up in yields? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you would need a pretty strong spike in inflation to make that happen. Okay. And I said, I was asking you to speculate. So I appreciate you doing that with us. Um, yep. All right. Well, I'm looking at the time here, Lance. Um, we're going to have to punt on the rant. Um, I'll, I'll tell well, you what it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, w- I was in a discussion the other day about the banking system and um, why, uh, you know, obviously one of the things that would have avoided the bank runs that we've seen if you had banks that, that had 100% reserves right? As opposed to 0% reserve ratio, right? But, you know, it, it's been very hard for the banks that tried to do that to uh, to be allowed to work in, in today's banking system. And I don't know all the reasons why, but um, my, my question for the rant was sort of like, you know, the U.S. is a big country, right? We've got a hundred over 100,000 towns and cities. Like, why don't we use like a test and learn approach where we take a couple of dozen you know, towns and cities around the country, and we just pilot different models. Hey, let's try this bank, this type of bank, right? Let's see how it does, right? Test and learn. And if we find things that say, oh, this actually makes, this is a better solution, great. Then we can kind of scale those learnings to the rest of the country, right? Uh, we don't do that. And, and so there's a whole discussion to be had around that for the banking system, but you could apply that same, you know, uh, process to, the healthcare system to the education system. You're smirking as I'm saying this. Probably one of those like great idea, never going to happen in the way the systems run. Oh, no, I know. Look, the, when, when the Affordable Care Act was first put out back in 2008. And by the way, I'm going to give you a timeline on this because we we can't do the right justice here with the timeline. I know. We have. So we're going to save this for next week. But, you know, just as an example, the reason that this is a great idea, right? And the reason it'll never happen is because we've done this. And, and I said, like when the Affordable Care Act came out in 2008, we were we were telling you all the reasons it wouldn't work, right? Just fundamentally, that's not how the healthcare system works. It'll it'll never bring costs down, and of course it didn't. But there was a there was a guy in Kansas that created a healthcare clinic, and it was all cash. He's like, you come in and you get a subscription to the healthcare clinic. It's 50 bucks a month. Aspirin were like a nickel, blood tests were like 13 cents. I mean, it's just, you know, you just paid a membership fee for this. And it worked fantastic. And it's a great model for the whole healthcare system. Again, the whole premise behind it is, is that you have catastrophic healthcare insurance. So if you get cancer, right. your insurance covers that. But it's like auto insurance, you take care of the maintenance, right? And then when you need it, 
the insurance kicks in. So insurance costs come down, healthcare cost improve, uh, healthcare quality improves, and the costs come down. It doesn't work because the reason is that the lobbies that drive the entrenched cartels will not let it exist. Yeah, exactly. And it's not the healthcare system; it's the banking cartel, J.P. Morgan, the, the top four banks that now own all the banking system. After this, you know, they're they're they are not going to allow something to interfere or in, or in, in, or inter, uh, impede their ability to make billions of dollars in revenue. All right. Uh, super depressing. Again, makes my blood boil even hearing you say this, and that's what the rants are for. Um, we're going to have to push it next off week. until next time. Next, next week. week. All right. So real, real quick, quick folks, a um, couple updates for you. One, I'm very excited to announce this. Um, I will have uh, more details for you shortly, but uh, we announced at our uh, recent conference that um, Wealthion just signed uh, a partnership uh, endorsing a Canadian financial advisor. And if you're Canadian and watching this, um, so many of you over the past you know, two years uh, have been asking us, when are you going to have a, a Canadian advisor? We finally now have one, I'm happy to say. Um, we had spent a lot of time trying to land uh, a different advisor for a long time uh, until we just realized the process was going to take even longer than, than we would have liked. Uh, and in the interim, an even better solution came our way. Uh, so, uh, if you are Canadian and you want to talk to that advisor, uh, it's the folks at, at Rocklink Financial. And uh, to set up a, a free consultation with them, you can do so today. Uh, just go to the normal form at wealthion.com and just make sure you select Canada as your uh, country and uh, your information will be sent to that firm. So, very excited to announce that we'll have the CEO of that firm, Jonathan Wellam, on the program either next week or the week after. So um, I'll have a, a nice conversation with him. We'll get his macro view. We'll get a sense for how he runs his, his shop there. Uh, you'll be able to kind of get to kick the tires with him live on this channel. Um, and then uh, he'll be in the stable going forward. Um, all right. Uh, reminder two, we did record that conference. It was amazing. Lance was a great part of it. Um, you've heard me say this all week, but if you uh, missed the conference, wish you had watched it. Uh, and are kicking yourself for it, please don't kick yourself too hard because you can actually watch the replay of the conference. You can go buy the replay videos over at wealthion.com slash conference. Um, all right, Lance. Well, look, in wrapping up here, um, first off, folks, if you continue to enjoy these weekly recaps with Lance, um, please do us a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. If you want to set up a free consultation uh, with Wealthion's U.S. Uh, advisors, if you're an American watching this, uh, perhaps even Lance and his team there at New Harbor uh, at the Real Investment <laughs> Advice. Sorry about that, Lance. Uh, <laughs> just digging it. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, but but if you actually want to talk to Lance and the guys at his firm too as well, uh, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. Only takes a couple of seconds. Whole process is free. Uh, there's no commitment to work with the guys. Uh, they'll just do their best to help you. Um, Lance, I'll let you have the last word here, folks, as we... Uh, we we let folks uh, head off from here to enjoy their weekends. Absolutely. Look, I, I you know I don't know what's going to go on with the markets next week. Um, you know, we'll just have to take it as we go here. Um, but you know, don't be surprised if this market winds up a little bit higher next week. Um, you know, that's going to kind of confound a lot of people with what's going on. But markets have an interesting way of doing exactly the opposite of what you think they should do. Yeah, and you know, as you, you've said many times in this channel, Lance, like when when everybody gets really nervous right uh and things get you know oversold or just you know the herd is really panicked the news doesn't need to be good necessarily to send the market higher it just needs to be not dire right it just needs to be less bad than it was right <laughs> exactly exactly so again you know try to just keep your emotions in check remember we're long-term investors and you know we just need to manage money accordingly so. all right well said all right Lance. well thanks so much buddy look forward to doing this again with you next week everybody else okay. thanks so much for watching